Setting up recording. Okay. Share screen. So today we're talking about op amps and comparators. And to start, we'll st start talking about op amps. Um, they're a pretty critical sort of analog building block uh, that you'll encounter all over the place. Um, and they're always drawn as a triangle. They've got plus and a minus sign, and these are the inputs. And then they have an output. So it's a three terminal device. Um, and also for, for clarity, we could draw the power supplies. It's going to have a positive rail and a negative rail. And so this will be like positive V. And you can give it oftentimes when you're doing a serious analog circuit, you'll have a negative rail, negative voltage rail. Um, and the op amp can then um, go output voltages that are positive and negative. The basic function of, a, of an op amp is that it takes the voltage that's between its positive and its negative inputs. This is called, this, this would be the non-inverting input and the negative sign one will be the inverting input. That's just a little terminology there. So it's basically going to take these the, the voltage that it sees between these and amplify it by some really, really large gain. Um, so you can imagine that, so here's a rule, the gain is huge. And so pretty much as, as soon as you, you, you know, you're talking on the order of like 100,000 or more, you know, Usually, like the gain is a figure of merit. You want a high gain in your op amp. So when you apply a small voltage between the positive and negative, um, it gets amplified. You get an amplified version at the output. Um, but you can see that's not um, well. Another way you could look at it is that the when the positive si non-inverting side goes higher than the, than the inverting side the op amp will start swinging its voltage up. Whereas when you apply a higher voltage at the negative or the inverting input, higher voltage there than the inverting, non-inverting input, the op amp drops its output. So that, that's a, as a function of this really huge gain. Um, the other rule that we have with op amps is that, um, there's no current going into the input. No current going into the input. So that's a, that's a very useful approximation. In reality, there's a very, very small current going into the input. We'll talk about that later if we have time, but in, but in, what, what we can approximate is we can say there's no current going into the inputs. Um, so they're what you would call high impedance inputs. But the output, the output is a low impedance. So it's, it's like some voltage that the op amp can maintain and put out, you know, maybe tens of milliamps at max. But that's still, that's still a lot for most circuits. Um, yes. Um, the next rule, which I always find, you know, difficult to, to state correctly, but it's that the op amp will always make sure that the, the voltage at the inputs are equal. So whatever you see VP, the op amp wants to make VP equal to VN only if you have negative feedback. That's the critical, um, stipulation there. So the op amp will make will main will it'll change its output in order to keep the voltage at the inputs equal if it has negative feedback. We'll keep voltage 
if and only if you have negative feedback. We'll see what negative feedback is in just a moment. So no current going into the inputs. Voltage at inputs is equal if you have negative feedback and the gain is very large. So let's, um, with that under in mind, let's look at the simplest, the simplest op amp circuit we can come up with. We've got a positive and negative input. Let's say I have a signal coming in here and I just were to take a wire and tie the output back to the input. And you might say, well, what's that going to do? Um, well, if the if the op amp the op amp now has negative feedback because there's there's feedback there's a path from the output voltage to the input voltage so we can apply that rule where the the out the op amp will change its output voltage in order to keep the inputs equal so if this is one volt you know initially the op amp will see you know that that that's way higher than zero volts, for example. So it's going to start increasing its output. Then it's going to hit one volt and it'll see that it's equal and there it will stay. So this is this is a very useful circuit called and it's um we would call a buffer amp. And it's not really amplifying because it's you know a gain of one. It's a gain of one. But say I had some device out here, some sensor that's putting out some voltage. But let's suppose that it's uh, it's got this really high input impede or output impedance. So this might be like, you know, one mega ohm. And what if I need to take that signal and, you know, so there's my sensor. Now, what if I need to take that signal and, you know, do things with it? Um, Usually you need it to be lower impedance so that you don't risk loading down that that signal and swamping it out. So here's there's an application of the simplest op amp circuit we can come up with. So let's take this this negative feedback a step further. Design ourselves another circuit where say we have some VN, but we'd like now let's say VN is kind of small, we would like to, to gain up, increase the gain. So we need our gain to be, say voltage gain to be greater than one. In this case, of course, the voltage gain is one. We need a voltage gain to be greater than one. Well, let's start with, let's start with what we are familiar with, our, you know, simple, the, you know, that gets us uh, a feed, a gain of one. But what if instead we're going to form a voltage divider between the output and ground? So now if the output is, if say the input is one volt and our output is one volt, let's say this is 10K and this is 10K. If our output is one volt, well, that's getting divided down by a resistive divider. So now you only have half a volt. So the op amp sees that difference and it starts increasing its output until it's at a voltage where you know these two will be equal. The positive going will be equal to the negative going. And so you can see the simple, the simple equation for our gain here is going to be one plus, say this is our feedback, we'll call this our ground, it's going to be one over RF over RG. And it, you can, I mean, the derivation is pretty simple, right? You know, the output voltage times R ground over RF plus R ground equals, um, well, you know that the, that the resultant frequent uh, voltage there is going to be equal to Vn, so the op amp will be happy and stop moving its output. And now if you just rearrange it and do some algebra, you get the following. So this is a really, this is a really handy amplifier uh, 
topology called the non-inverting amplifier because it doesn't invert the polarity of your signal. The gain is a, is a positive number. So if you put in one volt, you get two volts out. And likewise, if you put in negative one volt, you get negative two volts out, provided that the supply is bipolar like that. All right, so now let's, um, let's look at another op amp circuit. We just said, we just called this the non-inverting amplifier. As you can imagine, there is such thing as an inverting amplifier, which is in some ways, some ways uh, simpler, but it's, it's, it's different. So let's look at it. You're gonna have inputs like so. Typically you will tie this positive going input to ground. Then you have a resistor here and the resistor here, and there's our out, the out. So what, what's the behavior here? If, if we have some VN uh, and say VN is one, let's make this 10K, make this 10K. If VN is one volt and you're, you know, your positive, your non-inverting input is at ground, the op amp has negative feedback. So that means it's going to, um, want to make its negative going input to equal to ground. So if you have one volt here, you, you can see that the op amp has to swing down to negative one volt at the output because this is forming like a voltage divider between the input and the output where the, the resultant voltage is zero. So you can think of that equation as being like zero equals this difference V in minus V out times, let's call this R feedback, and we'll call this R in. And so we have a voltage divider there, R feedback over R feedback plus R in. So this sort of relationship holds. And if you if you do some algebra, if you do some algebra, what we will find out is that V out over V in, which is equal to our gain, is simply RF over R in. But it's negative. Because, right, so if we apply a one volt positive here, the output has to swing negative in order to keep the inputs equal. So this is, the gain here is a negative gain, so we call it an inverting amplifier um, with this factor RF over RN. Now there's, there's some important things to note about this amplifier. Um, first of all, what is the, if I'm some, if I have to take some device uh, and I'm trying to read the signal from it and amplify it through an inverting amplifier, what will this, what kind of effect will this have on that circuit? Because we know that this is at, you know, this is zero volts. So this node is also at zero volts and the op amp ensures, it guarantees that it will be so it does whatever it needs at, at the output in order to maintain zero volts here. So that means that if I had one volt here, the current going into R in is actually you know, one volt over 10K. So what is that, 0.1 milliamps? So that's, that's quite significant. You know, if you have a high impedance sensor, you know, that, that might be significant um, having this, um, this effect of actually drawing current uh, from, from whatever, uh, whatever device you're trying to read. So the, the input impedance of this amplifier is, is whatever our in is. Where, whereas with our inverting amplifier, the input impedance was very high because it's the input to an op amp. Um, so that, that could be on you know, tens of mega ohms, of, if not higher.
but this one, not so. This one, we're limited. We're limited on the imp input impedance by our Rn. So that's, that's just a, a good thing to note on that. And a, another piece of terminology is that we would call this this node here with that's going into the inverting input, we would call this the uh, virtual ground because it's its voltage is the same as ground, but it's it's virtual because it's not really you know, the only path the only path for the current to go. It's not a low impedance path to ground. The current is actually being sunk, you know, this way. So if I have to put in you know 0.1 milliamp here. I know that the op amp has to pull 0.1 milliamps through our feedback. Um, and that, that's where it's going, not going into the input of the op amp. So we call this a virtual ground. It's another piece of terminology there. Um, so that, yeah, let's, uh, that covers the inverting amplifier. So let's, what if we were to take um, we're almost going to sort of combine the inverting and non-inverting amplifier into another useful, another useful uh, amplifier, which is the differential amplifier. And you may you may recall I called the op amp at at its core as a differential amplifier. It takes that difference and amplifies it by a large gain. But it's really unusable because it's, you know, that large gain is, is you know, a hundred thousand or more, which is often unusable, and also it's not necessarily as consistent as we can achieve if we have negative feedback. So the differential amplifier is a really handy circuit. We're going to draw our. Let's actually flip those. Um, let's say I have a voltage here. <clears throat> Got some V in. I'd like to put it through this amplifier. Um, actually, I should draw it. I should draw this the other way. It'll make more sense. Let me just draw this out for us. Well, not the prettiest differential amplifier I've ever drawn. In fact, it's terrible. I hate it. Let's. <laughs> Sorry, I'm going to redraw it yet again. All right, there. That that's kind of a more pretty way of drawing it. And this is our V out. So let's let's break it down into some easily. Um, dis, all right, let's also call this. Um, I'm going to call this R2. This one is going to also be R2. So those are equal. This will be R1. And this will be R1. That's just a con. You can you can you can mix and match your resistor values if you want, but it will make the analysis of the gain a little more complicated. So let's break this down. Um, you can see on the, the positive side here, we have just a voltage divider. You know, uh, with the, uh, yeah, it's just a voltage divider. So you just divide down the high voltage down to some lower voltage. And then on the input to the negative side, we have an inverting amplifier, right? So the negative side is an inverting amplifier, but it's centered around the divided down positive voltage. So that takes that means however far the negative side is from the positive side, you will see that distance, but in the inverted sense. So instead of like instead of seeing that difference. Um, 
instead of seeing that difference being a positive difference, it like subtracts it because it's it's like a it's like a seesaw where you have like a you know the fulcrum of the seesaw is your virtual ground point, which is not ground, it's some voltage. Um, but uh, yeah. So the the I'll I'll spare you the the torture of of deriving anything. The gain of this is going to be the Vn. Uh, well, we don't need to even. Sorry. The gain is R two over R one, provided that R two here and here are equal, and that we have R one equal over here. Now the, the full expression for this, actually I should have prepared by writing this down. There is a full expression for if you want to mix and match, mix and match your, uh, your uh, resistor values. But I'll, I'll leave that as an, ex an exercise to the listener. It's usually you don't, you don't want to make your life unnecessarily hard. We'd like, we like it when R2 you know, this resistor and this resistor are equal. It, it makes the analysis easy. It's very nice. So, so that's good. So this is a very, this is useful when you would say you had some, you know, voltage source down here that were, you know, we don't know what it is. And you just want to know the voltage here. So you use a differential amplifier, and you um, and you can extract the the value of that voltage. Um, so there's there's more complicated diff amp configurations that we could draw. Um, we're doing good on time, so I'm, we might go into those at the end because I think they're useful. Um, so those are those are like how many. That was four different configurations, including the buffer amp. So those are your fundamental op amp circuits. Almost, I would say almost every op amp circuit is, is somehow derived from these fundamentals. So that's something just to keep in mind. These are good to know. Um, one thing, I'll, the next thing let's mention real quick is the concept of summing amplifiers. Um, so what if I have, you know, a couple different voltages and I'd like to add them all together. So whatever, for whatever reason you want to do that. Um, the easiest way to do this, because the math is the easiest, is to actually, you know, put all these resistors together. And you'll put them into an inverting amplifier, like so. And you can see that that well, then the, the formula for V out. So let's say this is R F, and this is R one, R two, and R three. V out is going to equal negative RF over R1 V1 minus RF over R2 V2 minus RF over R3 V3. So you see we've summed them together. Now we also inverted it, so that might be undesirable, but we have summed them all together. And then you could simply put it through another inverting amplifier and, uh, and get a higher gain out of it. Uh, or not a higher gain, well, you could get a higher gain, but you would, you would flip it so that you, you don't have this negative sign out here. Um, and now we can also see if all of your resistors, all, or say R1 equals R2 equals R3, then we have the expression RF over uh, R1 or whatever equals all this. 
That's great. We've summed everything together. Now, inverting it, of course. Uh, but that's not necessarily insurmountable. And th this works, this sort of works because you can think of these resistors like R1, 2, and 3 are acting like voltage dividers between each other. Um, so if I had, you know, this is easier to express if I say don't have a third voltage. Let's say I just have V1 is equal to one volt, V2 is equal to two volts, and R1 and R2 are equal. Well, I know now that this is 1.5 volts. And if that's 1.5 volts, now what if what if RF happened to also equal R1 and R2? Well, then I know that this is just 1.5 volts out here. So there I've summed together. Well, I didn't sum I I didn't sum them together. I sort of averaged them would be a more correct thing to say. Yes, that right, wait, I think I goofed something. This is ground, that's 1.5 volts, that's negative 1.5 volts. I goofed at least some expression, didn't I? So I feel like a professor. Um, what did I goof on? RF over R in all that, that's one, sum them up, one, two, blah, blah, blah. I think I know what I goofed on is that, is that this, we forgot about the current going through our feedback, you know, because it's not just a voltage divider between V1 and V2, it's also, there's also current going there. Okay, so maybe I can't explain it as intuitively as I would like, but but the but trust me that it works, I suppose. Trust me that it works. If we want, however, if we want a more intuitive amplifier that works a lot more like what I was saying, you can do the same, but have it be a non-inverting amplifier. So I'm gonna have my vistas like so then of course we'll sum together some voltages. Um, and this, this is going to require that these two be equal um, in order for it to act like a sum, summing amp with a unity gain. Because basically like what if I had one volt here and zero volts here, you know, and let's actually pretend this isn't there for a moment. This is going to end up being half a volt. And if I actually want to sum together zero and one, I have to gain that up again if I want to get the answer of one volt. So this gives us a, a gain of two um, that makes this all this whole thing work. And of course, you can imagine if I had another voltage. What if I had another voltage of one? Well, now we can see the this voltage ends up becoming like 0.33333. If I want the, does that? I think it does. Yeah, it does. Well, and now we've, now we've hit the problem of the inverting amplifiers where the gain expression becomes a bit more complicated because as you add more resistors, that gain expression becomes more complicated. With two resistors, it's great. It's real simple. You just make these equal and make, you know, make this one equal and this one equal, and, and you've got it. But, you know, it can be, certainly we can analyze it, but I don't want to belabor that here when we have other things to talk about, such as comparators. So let's, sorry, let me scroll a bit on the screen. I think it is now time to talk about comparators. So comparator, we, we draw it just like an op-amp. 
got a plus uh, non-inverting and an inverting input. And the rules are very similar, except that in that there's, we assume there's no current going into the inputs. Um, but the, the, the way that the function of a comparator is that if the voltage at the non-inverting is higher than the inverting, the output goes high. And if the, on the reverse case, if the inverting input is higher than the non-inverting input, it pulls the output low. So it's really, it's like a binary output. It's either it's high or it's low. And so in that sense, they're a lot simpler, uh, but the function is very you know, sort of comparable. You can often use an op amp as a comparator, but you really can't use an op, a comparator as an op amp. Um, a few other things is that typically, or it's very common that you'll get an, uh, a comparator that's called, a, they'll say the output is, quote, open collector. Uh, um, so open collector, what do we mean open collector? Well, what it means is, is they're giving you inside the op amp, you know, they're giving you a transistor connected to the negative rail. They're giving you a little, in the, if it's an open collector, you can assume it's a BJT that they're giving you. And you know, they, they have their internal circuitry that feeds this BJT so that when your negative going input is higher than the positive going input, it pulls the output down with the BJT. But when the positive going input is higher than negative going, it goes open collector. So it just releases this output so that you can have a resistor and you can pull this up to any voltage you like. So it doesn't have to be, you know, oftentimes you'll pull it up to the, v, the supply voltage, but not always. You know, you could, you can have that be any voltage you want. You can even use this to just drive LEDs or, or you know, shunt the current away from another BJT or all kinds of things. Um, so this is not true of like, not every comparator is open collector output, but a lot of them are. Um, so you just have to check the data sheet or, and know your comparators. Um, other comparators are just a push-pull output where they, um, when they're high, they just source current and, and you know, hit the rail. And when they're low, they're low. So that's, that's the rundown on comparators. However, there's a, when implementing comparators, there's a few important considerations that we have to take into account. So let's suppose I have two voltages and surprise, surprise, I want to compare them. And when V2 is, let's say when V1 is higher than V2, so V1 goes in there, V2 goes in there, V1 is above V2. Uh, well, let's actually say that, let's say when V2 is higher than V1, I want to light an LED. Nice little circuit, we'll do this. So I know because it's an open collector comparator, um, I know since it's an open collector comparator that, um, it will be able to sync current, you know, when the negative going input exceeds the positive going, pulls the output down, current flows to the LED and it lights. Great. Um, but but let's let's imagine, you know, your power supply, we haven't talked about that in a while. Power supply is all the way over here. And you know that in the lines there's inductance and there's parasitic resistance. And all of this, you know, feeds into everything else over here. Feeds into not only the, the uh, comparator, but let's suppose my, my V1, you know, so I'll, I'll call this my VCC. Suppose my 
you know, V2 is some kind of changing voltage, but V1, let's say I just have a, a voltage divider forming some specific voltage, right? So what happens when the supply voltage, when I suddenly turn on this LED, there could be a tiny, tiny drop in the supply voltage. We're not talking big drop, we're talking, it, it could be millivolts. But this, the comparator inputs are very sensitive. So you change something by millivolts on the, on the supply rail, you know, either supply rail, positive or negative, you know, that com the comparison operation can change, you know, and therein lies an issue. So say my, say my V2 is like increasing really slowly. And at some point, you know, so this is V2 and V1 is pretty stable. But at this crossover point, as the LED is switching on, you might see v, V1 briefly fluctuate and ripple just a little bit by just a few millivolts, not by much, but enough that the, the comparator will switch its output multiple times. Um, so the comparator output, you know, could be like something like, well, then it's going to settle on the, or in this case, in this case, we're talking about it being high. And then at this point, it switches low like this and then goes low. So, you know, okay, so if you're lighting an LED, uh, you probably don't care, right? because it's going to light up and it'll look fine. But if you're si what if you were signaling a microcontroller or something, or you were trying to uh, toggle a flip-flop or something, you know, something that you can't have it bouncing like this. You can't have it you know, trigger your flip-flop multiple times. You need it to be immediate on, a hard, like a immediate and clean switch. So this introduces the topic of hysteresis. Um, so hysteresis. So let's assume now I'm back to you know having a voltage source, um, and I know that when my voltage goes low, well suppose I suppose I put some resistance you know, between my voltage source and my input. Then what what I want to have happen is when the output changes it needs to very subtly, very in a very small amount, it needs to change my V in, or, or it needs to change the voltage that's being seen at the input to the comparator. So I can do that by just adding a resistor to the output. So you'll note this is kind of, you know, it feels kind of bad. It's like because we're introducing positive feedback instead of negative feedback. Um, which is usually a no-no, but in this case is critical to the correct operation of your circuit. So, you know, so I might make this like one kilo ohm, and then I might make this much larger, so one mega ohm. And again, I'm going to make an analogy of this being a lot like a voltage divider. And, and, you know, we can assume that this resistance is small, um, so when this is high, it's very close to the supply voltage at the output. And when this is low, it's very close to ground. So I can model this again as a voltage divider. So let's say the actual V at the positive input, let's say the actual V at the negative input. If, you know, let's draw a little plot here. P voltage. Uh, let's get some colors. Um, say this is my, okay, that's V2. My reference, rep, why is this so hard? Reference voltage is like this. My V positive, V positive, when 
when our voltage at the output is high, right, Vp is going to be very subtly above V1. And when it hits that comparison point and the switch occurs, that voltage then goes down because you've switched the behavior of your voltage divider. You know, if I had, a, if I had, say, There's, there's the equivalent circuit you know, in the first state. But then when my output switches, it switches to this other state. So you get a nice sharp, um, you, you'll get this sharp um, switching action. And you won't, you know, the, the action, the changing voltage will change faster um, then the, the comparator can, um, can react. So th this pretty much, this is a guaranteed, this is guaranteed to work pretty much. There's always like, there's certain fluctuations that might occur if you haven't correctly conditioned your V2 signal to be, you know, ideal. Of course, you can always cause weird behavior, but this is a good solution. So this is what we would call adding hysteresis. Because you see now, it, if we wanted to switch, if we want to switch the LED on, we only need this voltage. But suppose we want to now switch the LED off. Now we need this new voltage, right? We need this voltage now to switch the LED off. So we have this hysteresis. You have this range of voltage, this like difference between the switch on and the switch off. Um, and usually that's not like, in, in this sort of case, you need that behavior. Um, it's necessary to, to make it work. Of course, like I said, in this case, we're just switching an LED, so we probably don't care in reality. But if you were switching like a flip-flop or an interrupt to a microcontroller, then you would care. Th that's my spiel on comparators. Um, we have a few more minutes. If anybody's interested, we could talk a little more about difference amplifiers. Or do we think that's a good, good lecture for today? What do we think? No, we've got probably 10 minutes before we want to bug out for GB. Yeah, we'll save the rest for another day. I think this is good. So I'll stop recording. First, you got to stop sharing.